Je suis très heureuse de vous présenter Riccardo Farcinelli, que j'ai eu l'honneur de connaître euh, par ses euh, couvertures magnifiques qu'il a, qu a faites pour euh, plusieurs maisons d'édition italiennes. Euh, pour, les non, pour les non italiens, c'est moins familier, mais c'est quelque chose vraiment qui frappe l'imagination euh, collective en Italie. Et les, les, les couvertures de Minimum Fax, notamment, et, et plus récemment des de Naudi. Et mais Riccardo Facinelli, donc, il n'est pas seulement graphiste ou visual designer, comme il aime se définir. Il est aussi euh, un chercheur et euh, un enseignant. Il enseigne notamment à l'ISIA euh, de Rome, qui est l'Institut pour les industries artistiques euh, de la ville. Il enseigne la psychologie de la perception, donc euh, la, la discipline dont il s'occupe dont, dont et qui sera au centre de son, de son euh, intervention aujourd'hui, est la façon dont, euh, qu'est-ce qu'il arrive dans notre, dans notre esprit lorsque nous regardons les choses. Il est l'auteur euh, de plusieurs livres, euh, parmi, euh, parmi eux trois euh, graphic novels, mais qui font partie, euh, comme il vient de me dire, de sa vie précédente, et euh, notamment de deux livres de recherche qui s'appellent euh, « Guardar, penser et projeter neurosciences pour le design »,« Regarder, penser, concevoir, projeter neurosciences pour le design », et euh, plus récemment, une critique euh, portative au visual design euh, que j'ai ici avec, euh, avec moi, dans laquelle il réfléchit sur les, les, les stratégies et la, et la, de, la, de la communication visuelle et qui définit ainsi son objet. Euh, dans le visual design, euh, la forme ne suit pas la fonction mais l'intention. Et le visual design, la projetation et les projets de tout ce que nous percevons euh, par les yeux, mais en synesthésie avec les autres sens et euh, en rapport à l'imagination. Et, euh, il nous parlera en anglais euh, et après pour les débats on, on fera tout le possible pour, aussi bien pour euh, <coughs> converser directement en, en anglais ou pour traduire les, les, les questions. Donc je lui donne la parole. Sa communication s'appelle Brave New Gaze, How Design Shapes Our Way of Seeing. So thank you for inviting me today. Um, before I start, uh, just a couple of things I want to say. As Barbara started uh, saying, introducing me, um, I am a graphic designer, a particular kind of graphic designer, because I do only book design. I do mainly books, some magazines and newspapers. So I work in a very specific field. And I want to keep this in mind because the theory I'm going to propose to you today has to do with some things that I've been thinking doing this kind of job during the last 15 years. The second thing is I am a teacher and a scholar and despite of what I do as a, a professional, I do not teach graphic design but I teach psychology of perception. That means what happens in the mind of people when they look at design things. I do, I do teach to designers of course. And I want to, you to keep in mind this thing as well because What I'm going to propose to you today is a theory not from the side of the designer, but from the side of the people who look at design. So, now I start officially, and I start with this. A very simple and common object, a pencil. Deciding which kind of image project to you today, I started thinking that I wanted to have something that was universal, iconic, very simple, very common, like this kind of pencil that I'm showing you now. I want in something that now that you see that, at least here today, you would consider it as a true pencil, not just any pencil, but the pencil. And I think one of the qualities this image have has is that the pencil is yellow. I mean, one of the things that make this kind of pencil a classic is the color. To prove this, I started making a research in Google Images, and um, I tried to ask what, what is the, the collective imagination about pencils. For example, if I show you these two, the second one is not so classical. I mean, no one would easily define that one a classical pen, not only because it's a technical pencil, but also because it has a different shape that has not established as a classical and as a color that is, has not has been so um, historically founded, I would say. 
So I, I made this um, research in Google Images, and this is what came out. As you can see, I just wrote pencil. All the first occurrences that come out are yellow wood pencils. This is significant because this kind of engine search with the tags that people use to upload images. So this is a concrete proof of what we usually call the collective imagination. Collective imagination is not just something abstract that uh, we talk about in university. This is working. And I've done the same in French and in Italian. I have to confess that the, um, the quantity of yellow pencil that come out with the English word is much bigger than Italian or French, but it's almost the same. And I've done the same with a professional searching engine like iStock that is a gallery stock for professional graphic designer. It's a, it's a cheap one, it's not a very valuable one, but the first image that comes out is a traditional wood classical yellow pencil. So um, before going on with this, I think I have to tell you where this yellow comes from, because it has an, an history, a very specific one. First of all, the first pencil, as we know today, I mean a piece of graphite with enclosed in a piece of wood, come out in 1790, has been invented here in France by Nicolas Jacques Conté, who wanted to find uh, a way not to pay England, because England had a lot of blocks of graphite. And he said, if I make the um, pencil here uh, with this kind of structure, I can use a powder of graphite. I mix it with clay and make this, uh, I don't know what is the word in English, probably impasto, something like that. And I can have a cheaper product, a mass product. It was a success. Also because wood did not make the hand dirty. And in those <coughs> days, it was the beginning of the world of amateur. People who draw, design, paint for leisure, something that before was mm, wasn't contemplated in any way. The first pencil with a paint outside is a century later, 1890, at the Chicago Exhibition. The reason why the pa the, that kind of pencil was painted, was coated, was probably because the wood was not top quality, that was used for furniture. So they decided to paint it the outside, not to um, show the imperfection the wood had. The society, the producer of this first yellow painted pencil, it was yellow of course, is Koinur, that is up today one of the major producers of pencil in the world. It was a success. Koinur sold literally millions of pieces and up today, 130 years later, Koinur is still a, one of the stronger producers of pencils, of wood pencils. And what you would like to know is that today, two-thirds of all the pencils produced in the world are yellow, 100 and years, 130 years later. I think this is a very significant fact from many different point of view, commercial, psychological, historical. And the thing that I want to discuss to you today, iconographic, the fact that something the image of something starts to dwell in our mind. The yellow pencil is a sort of platonic idea of the pencil. Maybe we don't use it, but we consider it the pencil. I made a, another different research. I um, look of all the advertisement who needs pencil to show some kind of concept. For example, all the advertisement used to promote schooling if there's a pencil, nine out of 10 is a yellow wood pencil. Before going on, I have a little anecdote about this. At the beginning of the 90s, uh, end of the last century, um, um, there has been made a market research in an um, American office. They proposed to the employees of this office a new kind, a new brand of pencils. Half were yellow and half were green. And they ask, use them and say which one you find the best. After a week, 
all the employees were very, very critical towards the green ones. <laughs> and they said they were difficult to sharpen, the graphite was too fragile, and in general, they, they didn't like them at all. Of course, as you can imagine, they were the same. The only thing that changed was the paint. And this paint, this yellow paint, has no uh, functional reason because, as you know, yellow pencils do not write in yellow. It's a more a metaphorical choice. Uh, one thing I forgot to say, um, the reason why Koinur chose the yellow probably is due to a nationalistic reason because they had the headquarters in Bohemia and yellow was the official color of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Other scholars say that the yellow is a tribute to China because part of the graphite came from China. And in China, yellow is the color of the imperial family. By the way, this yellow has become something that is more than just a um, design choice or a choice of style or taste. I think it, it has become something that we can say, something that we, we have to deal with. When we design something, people expect things to be in some ways. In this case, the yellow is an idea people have in mind. And so we have to consider that. If we design pencil, we have to face these expectations <coughs> people have. Uh, as you know, uh, today almost everything we deal with is produced in many copies. If you look around the clothes we have, this glass, this smartphone, the light on the ceiling, are all things that, are, that have been produced in more than one piece. And this is also the traditional definition of industrial design, something that you made in more than one piece, in more copies from a prototype. But nowadays, this um, way of producing things, this uh, design concept, does not uh, uh, deal have to do relate only to artifacts made by by man. For example, when we write something on the social networks, our words are seen at one time on a million different devices. In a way, our words become something that has a design quality because they are, they are spread by a mass medium. Um, on the other hand, uh, this condition now has to do with things that not necessarily um, are made by men. For example, um, if you look at fruits, apples and oranges. Oh, these are the first coin or pencils I forgot to show you, 1890. And these are what they sell today. As I was saying, oranges. These are the oranges we find in supermarkets. Um, before these fruits arrive to the market, there is a practice uh, that is um, uh, used by the supply chain to choose which fruits goes to the supermarket and which not. And to do that, the fruit are um, made pass through a ring. This ring measures the um, average shape and then there is a choice of the color. So at the end, if you have fruits like this with weird shape, bizarre, or of not the right kind of hue, they are discarded and they are sent to make fruit juices. These are real oranges just picked up, picked down from the trees. This is a ph photograph that came from Sicily. As you can see, different shapes, bigger, smaller, different hue. We have yellow ones and we have orange ones. But the, this is another kind of orange, weird shape, grainy surface. But this is what we find in the supermarket. This is mass distribution. In these terms, mass distribution, the work made, the, the selection made by the supply chain is indeed an act of design. Because they design the way we are going to look at things first. And second of all, because they are designing our own gaze, the way we expect things to be. I mean, at the end, we treat, especially small children, I, I saw, we treat uh, these kind of fruits as they came out from a factory, 
is mm, from a philosophical point of view is not so different to have something that has been made identical by a mold or printed or the fact that these oranges look identical because one of the um, biggest effort industry mass media do today is to make things look in a certain way there are technical reason is much more easier to distribute stock and sell identical things but also is much easier to control how to you sell things if you have um, an average of appearances if you would sell something like this you would risk that people would pick only one kind and not another if you have identical things you are much more sure that all the stock will be sold. This is a um, mainstream supermarket. So um, what I'm saying first with the pencil, now with the oranges, is that the fact that the market today need things, but they also need their coherent representation. And so we have to design objects and their representation because this is what uh, in many fields of communication is asked for. I have another example to refine this discourse. Now a pen. Um, as before, I choose a very common one, uh, a cheap one, a disposable one, and a classical one an icon that is the big blue. If you have to buy one of these pens, um, and I'm quite sure any of you has this experience in his life at least once, it happens that when you go in the, in the shop, that can be an um, uh, art shop or even a tobacconist, as you know, you usually have a box, a small box, or a glass with more than one pen. You have 10 bigs, and all look the same. If by chance I take one and I discover that the cap has a mistake in the molding, a little flow, it's high probable that I put it down and take another one. And this is not something that just uh, crazy consumers do. I have 10 pens, they all look the same. If I take one and one has a little flow, why not to take another one? There is nothing wrong, wrong with that. But a flow in the cap doesn't mean necessarily that the pen will not work well, will not write well. I think the reason why we, um, or the majority of people, behave like this is because we have interjected the nature of these objects to be identical, that we want to possess the most identical of all. We don't want the um, singular piece. When we buy this kind of object, we want to possess the general idea, the design of it, of which the singular pen is just a, a simulacrum, a proof. When we buy design things, mainly we buy the idea. So in different ways, the pencil, the oranges, and this example now, um, as you can see, have to do of what we, as a consumers, as a users, think of design, not of how things have been designed. And as I say, um, this behavior is not, I don't think it's something that have to do with people with neurosis or uh, crazy, uh, way of thinking. It's something very easy, very simple, very common, very everyday life. And what I think is that we have so much interjected this um, quality of design objects that even a detour from this norm tend to confirm that things stay in these terms. For example, um, a totally different um, world. Uh, you may know the um, local food movements. 
uh, in big cities, especially among urban rich classes, uh, has got a great success in the last 20 years. If you decide to buy from this kind of supply, you refuse the supermarket and you want people who um, grow and sell food not far from where you live. You receive a case, most of the time, with different vegetables. Usually the one they are available in that particular moment of the year in that season. These fruits and vegetables have some characteristics and one of that, pencils, pens, and one of that here is the fact that we have unusual shapes. We have bizarre forms in apples and oranges. And also we have insects and sometimes the salad is browsed on by snails. Now, if by chance, one day, in one of these cases, would happen to be, by chance, oranges all of the same shape, by chance, people would be suspicious. <laughs> and this is why we so much expect the imperfection from this case that we refuse the extreme regularity. I mean, from a psychological point of view, the local food movement, the farm to table product are conceivable only because we know mass market, supermarket. They live together. The last example is this one. Yet yeah, also in big European cities, not in the States. Um, it's quite common to have people uh, who sell objects from the um, artisanery from Africa. Masks, small statues, and the quality of these objects, the way they are presented, is the fact that they come from the draftsmanship of Africa. They are made by hand, one by one. But if you go to the man who is selling them, this photograph is taken in Porta Portese in Rome, that is a flea market. Um, if you go them, to them and you ask, I like this mask, may I have three like this? He opened the box <laughs> and he has plenty. So although these pieces are truly made by hand, one by one, they are design things. <coughs> because I think this African sculpture proved that design is not uh, the uh, manufacturing through machines, but is the industrialization of processes. These object, objects are meant for the European gaze, for the European markets, and for the European shopping practices. In our way of selling things, we know that if something works, if something sells, it's a good idea to have more than one pieces. It's a good idea to have copies. Because this is why, how today we buy things. May I have more than one, two, three? Do you have them? Yes, I have. Okay, I take four. In this case, we don't have the same kind of procedure. We have when Koinur make the pencils. But you have the same way of buying things, of thinking of things. So, a pencil, an orange, a plastic pen, a mask or a statue. And also I can say a smartphone because as you know, um, these objects are often assembled by hand by the underpaid forces that are in the third world. There is a lot of making by hand in product, productions. It's only for our own comfort that we consider the orange a piece of nature and these a technological device. Because from a psychological point of view, we treat them in the same way. We tend to consider them things we can dispose in more than one piece 
that we can dispose in an indefinite number of pieces. So design today has to do a lot of how uh, the, the traditional definition of design, the serialization from a prototype, has to do with a prototype that stays in the mind of the consumer, not in the mind of the designer. I was fascinated by the drawing that Hélène showed us before, that kind of book when you have uh, the design world from one side and uh, um, the consumer, the people who look at that on the other, and he says design is what it happens in between. I think it's absolutely that. Totally different image. When Picasso and Braque start the Cubist movement in 1912, they do something that I find fascinating. They start to using pieces of collage, newspaper, bus tickets. If you look at these paintings, as, uh, this collage, the significant fact is the fact, is the fact that the piece of the Figaro stays on the canvas to depict itself. It's not just a bag piece of paper to make a, just a bag collage. They use a piece taken from reality. I take a piece of newspaper and I put it on the canvas, meaning itself. This painting says that in the modern world, this is a still life, still life depicts a kind of reality. This painting says that in the modern world do exist tables, glasses, guitars, and newspapers. That means mass media. This is a, the first still life with mass media in it. Picasso is not using a piece of newspaper to make something different, to sig signify something different. Use a piece of newspaper, a piece of mass media, to depict that in the world mass media do exist and are a very important part of our experience of reality. Why I'm telling you this? Um, because I think that that kind of psychological image that people have in mind of the pencil, of the universal pencil, of the platonic pencil, or the expectation we have towards fruits and African mask are something that do exist only because mass media make them exist. Mass media are the way to build this kind of um, psychological life. Mass media has power of life and death on things because in our society from 1912 up today there is only one way to make something exist, talking about it. Mass media are a long, 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 long talk about things. And when I say mass media, uh, I mean any kind of mean that put in communication um, people. Mass media is not just the newspaper. Mass media is the social network, but even the post office. We have to consider mass media any media who create a connection between people, who allow this kind of talking about it. In a way, mass media, I can say, are the filters that allow us to think the, the world in the way I'm, I'm trying to tell you. Uh, the yellow pencil has established as a psychological standard because we have seen not only yellow pencil, but also their, their display, their depictions, their representations. Uh, in Renaissance pa paintings, if you look at the Holy Virgin, most of the time she has a blue veil. That color came from a theological and economical reason. Uh, the blue pigment, the lapis lazuli, was the most expensive color of all, and so was the one was considered uh, the best to depict sanctity. But when we have our yellow pencil today, that yellow has not um, a reason like this. The pencil is not yellow to mean something. The yellow stays there because we expe expect things to be in a certain way.
Um, as, I see, uh, uh, as you have just seen, I repeated more than one time mass media, mass media, mass media. I didn't say advertising. This is because I think advertising is just a small part of the mass media processes. Uh, in mass media now, we have um, video games, television, TV series, magazines. Um, and all of these different subjects build these discourses about things. Metaphorically, we don't talk about the yellow pencil only through advertisement. We see them in movies and so on. And to my advice, one of the um, mistakes that has been made by the classical criticism toward advertising is the fact that um, most of the scholars set uh, an equation between advertising and capitalism. I think this is very imprecise because advertising has to do before the economical system with the mass. I mean, if, if we have a mass society, and a mass society can be a communist one, then you had advertisement. So uh, to criticize advertising, saying that it's the voice of capitalism, is very partial. Because under Stalin, we had a strong and even beautiful advertising. We have advertising every time we have, oops, a mass society. Every time we don't communicate within a small village, but our relationships are huge, wide, worldwide. And in fact, if you think of um, some subjects that are very critical toward capitalism and our economical system with their brutalities, think of Greenpeace, think of um, Emergency Medicine Sans Frontier, they have advertisement. They need it because today, if you don't make people know what you do, you virtually do not exist. Um, so I invite you to think of mass media in a more wide way. I like this definition of something that talks about something. something. Of course, the question we have to ask ourselves is, yes, but to do what? What we want to use these means to do what? Um, I think this is why today for people who deal with design is important to keep mass media in a very big consideration. Because every day more we are asked to design things, but also to design the way to talk about it. From this point of view, uh, I could even say that design and mass media are two sides of a same coin. One cannot live without the other. And this is why at the beginning of my talk I said, I am a book designer that is a very specific thing and I want to keep this in mind. Because I work in a field where um, the kind of product I design is, at the same time, is display. When I design a book cover, that graphics is the object. But when the object is put in the window of a bookshop, is, is advertisement as well. It has a double role, a double life at the same time. Think of this. If we uh, consider um, um, a cultural object, like the complete, I'm talking about books, the complete works of Wittgenstein. This kind of object has a very specific public. When I design these books and I put them in the library, in the book, um, the bookshop, and people look at them, that is advertisement. No way. Because in that position, the publisher is asking me to design the prestige, the um, authority he has. Because if you want to sell Wittgenstein, you have to look 
prestigious. That means in the cultural world, something that has a strong quality in it. When people buy it, those books start to be a commodity. When people bring those books at home and put on the bookshelf or on the coffee table, those objects start to be interior design. Only at the end, when we have read it, they are a cultural value. This is very important from my point of view. Um, thinking that those books are a cultural value in the window of the bookshop is a mistake. Today, things are different things in different moments of their life. And sometimes they are all the things together. I design books that are sold only to decorate homes. And I design books that are sold only to be studied by oneself. And now I arrive to my conclusions. Today, today, the kind of power we deal with do not need to famine us to have control on us. We do not deal with kings. We deal with corporations. And corporations need our content more than our fear. In this way, the yellow pencil I've chose for my talk is, of course, a metaphorical choice. One of the strongest form of control we have today is expectations. This that do doesn't mean that we have to rebel and not to design any more yellow pencils, but does not mean that we have to consider that. That from the point of view of the people who buy things, and today all of us construct part of our identity or of our lifestyle th through shopping, Corporations have this strong power in the hand. The fact that we think that the world is in a certain way, that maybe all the pencils are yellow. Just uh, funny things to conclude. This is a frame from Alice in Wonderland by Walt Disney. And these are pencil birds. To make them recognizable, because they are very funny little animals, the Disney the animators made them look as what people expect a pencil to be. And in fact, I make this little trick. I try to color them with the same color they have in the body. And it's much more difficult to understand in a blink what they are. It's the yellow that makes them understandable as a drawing. This is the subtle power of images today. They work without that we think about that. Or look at this one. I find on the internet, I don't know who have done it, is a chair made of pencil. Of course, if the pencil were blue, was absolutely less immediate to understand what the joke was in this <laughs> structure. Um, I think I've said all I wanted to say to you today. What, um, <coughs> what is amazing about these conditions we deal with is, in, is that it, that's from a certain point of view, this uh, interplay between design and mass media has so, uh, granted as a sort of new Platonism, but this time in real life. Today, we, as a designers, have to consider this. What is the platonic idea people have of things? And this platonic idea has been built by shopping. And as they say in the entertainment industry, that's all, folks. <laughs>